Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. It is Saturday, June 5th. We've got a great guest this weekend. Her name is Katie Milkman. She is an award-winning behavioral scientist. She's a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's got a new book out. It's called How to Change, The Science of Getting from Where You Are to where you want to be. Now, considering that that is essentially our entire goal of this program, helping you get where you are to where you want to be, this book was incredibly instructive. And our interview with Katie begins with something that I think is important for all of you to remember, and that is the power of starting with a blank slate. Here is the first part of our interview with Katie Milkman. So you started your book with the story of Andre Agassi. Now, why'd you do that and explain how that gets us into this idea of how to change? Yeah, I started the book with Andre Agassi first because tennis is my language. That's what I grew up playing. That's one of the reasons. But but second, to make a really important point about behavior change and, and the nature of being smart about change. So the story involves a pivotal moment in Agassi's career where he was really struggling despite having lots of media attention for his flashy clothes and flashy attitude and style. He actually wasn't doing very well on the tour. He was ranked something like 32nd in the world in the early 1990s, despite everyone's expectations that he would be dominating the tour based on his childhood prodigy status and his talent. And he has this pivotal conversation with Brad Gilbert, who was a superstar who'd just written a best-selling book called Winning Ugly and had outperformed his talent vastly on the tour. He was another pro player who had reached number four in the world despite having very little talent. So a really different story. And Gilbert pointed out to Agassi that the key flaw in his game was that he was too self-focused. He didn't think about his opponent enough on the court. He went out there and he had this set of shots that he would try to hit. He would go for winners and he was so good that it took him quite far and he won a lot of matches, but didn't do nearly as well as he could if he had been thinking more strategically, letting his opponent sometimes lose, letting his opponent make mistakes, putting pressure on the opponent and understanding how to play a more strategic game. And of course, the the happy ending to this story is that after taking Brad Gilbert on as coach, Agassi goes on to win the US Open after being unseated, meaning no one expected him to perform well in the tournament at all. He wins it. He's the first unseated player to ever win the U.S. Open in the last, you know, in decades. So it's a big historic event. And then he goes on to hold the number one ranking in the world for something like 100 weeks starting after this pivot. Of course, there were ups and downs, but his career really turns around. And I use this story to make the point that being strategic is absolutely critical. If there's one thing I have taken away from a career studying change, it's that too often we reach for one size fits all solutions. Instead of being strategic, thinking about our opponent, what are we up against? What is the barrier to change? If we understand whether we're facing a challenge and unable to make progress on change because we're having difficulty getting started, or it's a self-confidence problem, or we're forgetting, or we have bad habits, or maybe it's because we procrastinate or are impulsive. What's the challenge? And then actually the solution that science suggests will be most effective differs. We need to tailor our solutions to those challenges. So that's why I start there. I think that the other aspect of this, which is there's no simple way to give somebody um, sort of the template to succeed or to get from where you are to where you want to be. It also resonates with me because obviously this is a show where people contact us and say, here's my financial situation. What should I do? And I feel like having that direct kind of advice is really helpful. But what I also know is that people, they contact us because maybe they feel like they're unsure of themselves, but also because they don't know where to start. So I'm hoping you can help identify this idea around the power of a blank slate, the when you start to try to do something. And if you could talk a little bit about that, I think that would be really helpful for folks listening who are saying like, I like listening to this. I'm a voyeur, but I, I could never call Jill myself or I don't know even where to start. Yeah, this is one of the most interesting topics I've had the pleasure of studying, I think. And the impetus for doing work on trying to find when are the moments to start came from giving a presentation to a bunch of executives at Google about a decade ago about different tools and tactics that could be used to 
promote change, including change around personal savings decisions. They wanted to make sure that their employees were financially secure, and, and many of them were opting into their 401k plan, for instance. And I got this fantastic question, which was, okay, we want to offer all of these tools. There's all these nudges we can use to try to improve financial wellness, health and wellness as well. Is there some ideal time to offer them to our employees? When should we be offering them? Is there a moment when they're particularly motivated to take on the challenge of change? And I thought it was such a fascinating question. And it provoked this research I did with Heng Chen Dai, who's a professor at UCLA Anderson, and Jason Reese, who's a senior fellow at Wharton, where we determined that there are moments in our lives where we're more open to change. And there are moments that look like chapter breaks in our lives, because the way we think about time isn't linear. We think about our life like a series of chapters, like we're characters in a book. And we close one chapter, open another, say, at the you know, the Boston years or the college years or the consulting years, whatever it is, there's different things that bookend those chapters in our lives, when we open a new chapter, we feel like we have a new beginning and a clean slate. And one of the best known examples of this is New Year's, which is a bookend for many of us. We think about time discontinuously around New Year's. We say, okay, it's a new year, a new me. I can do it. You know, I can say that was the old me who didn't enroll in the 401k or didn't quit smoking, didn't make better decisions. And the new me has a clean slate and a fresh start and is going to be more capable than the old me was. So it turns out there's a lot of moments like this, and we even can see them on calendars. So the start of a new week, the start of a new month, the beginning of of an era after a holiday is celebrated, particularly holidays that feel like fresh start. So more think Memorial Day or Labor Day and less Valentine's Day. And also birthdays also seem to motivate this sense of a fresh start and a clean slate in our research. And we've shown that people are more likely to do things like search for the term diet on Google or visit the gym or set goals on popular goal setting websites at these fresh start moments. And if we invite someone, for instance, to start saving to open a 401k, we did an experiment with thousands of people who weren't yet saving in a 401k. And we simply highlighted a moment and said, do you want to start saving after the start of spring or after your upcoming birthday? We offer them that opportunity that improves the rate of savings over the following eight months compared to inviting someone to save at exactly the same time delay, but not highlighting the association with a fresh start rate. So two people have a birthday in two months. One gets an offer. Do you want to start saving in two months? The other, do you want to start saving after your birthday? We see 30% more savings in the following eight months in the group invited to begin after a fresh start date. So I remember interviewing Dan Pink a few years ago when he wrote that book, When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. And it made so much sense to me that, you know, that there are these inflection points. I think financial service companies have known this forever because they talk about, you know, trying to hit people when they're ready to make some sort of change. And that could be obviously change of job. It could be retirement. It could be birth. It could be death. It could be divorce. I also want you to take people off the hook for not being able to necessarily do it. So if you you point out that, you know, yes, of course, we all see those statistics, 80% of those New Year's resolutions fail, but you say 20% actually succeed and there's always another chance. So why is it with some people it just takes longer to get it going? What, what have you found in your research about that? There are all these other barriers besides just getting started that that we need to tackle in order to make sure that change will persist. And by the way, I love that I love that you interviewed Dan Pink about when and I love that book. It was one of the first books that covered our research in a really in-depth way and and brought fresh starts and the fresh start effect we've studied to wide attention. And I'm a huge fan of his. I think the important point though is just getting started isn't enough, right? You need a plan, you need a path forward, you need to stay motivated, you need to persist, you need to build habits. And so it's only the beginning to start. One thing, though, that is really wonderful is when you recognize that, first of all, there's lots of tools, and this is part of why I wrote a book that has more than one chapter, that can help with other elements of change. But also, there are some things we can do when we're feeling motivated, when we have that flush of excitement at the start of a new year, after a birthday, whatever it is that focuses our attention on the need to change and makes us motivated to do so. There are some things we can do where you don't need more than that momentary motivation to make a big difference. And I think actually focusing on those kinds of opportunities can be really valuable. So an example is, right, you set up a recurring 
deposit into a savings account, right? An, an auto deduction from, say, your checking account to your savings account. You do it once and it carries you forward. You don't have to have sustained motivation for a decision like that. Enrolling in a 401k or increasing your contribution in your 401k is another kind of decision. If you're feeling that motivation, it's one time, one act that has this really long set of benefits. Because most of us, once we've set something up, we forget it. Inertia is a, mag a magical potion that if used in a good way can be really valuable. So I just want to highlight that too. You also say, I mean, I think I love the chapter about impulsivity because I wrote a book. Maybe you want to have me on your podcast, girl. I'm um, <laughs> called The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. And there is a certain amount of this emotional body that we carry with us, right? And to some extent, I think that this idea where people, they start with something they're on track, but they're diverted and it may be their own emotions that divert them or maybe they get sucked into something because, you know, we know that there are temptations everywhere, not just spending temptations, but, you know, investing temptations. So tell us a little bit about impulsivity and the way to trump that impulsive nature that we as human beings have. Yeah, impulsivity is one of my favorite topics. It's actually probably the the reason I became a behavioral scientist is learning that this is something that could be modeled and tackled systematically by economists. And I was just fascinated because it resonated so much. So economists call this present bias. It's the tendency we have to overweight anything that will give us immediate gratification and underweight or undervalue long-term goals, long-term returns that we, we get, whether it's in the market or in life, in some other walk of life. And it leads us to make impulsive decisions. Present bias leads us to make lots of mistakes because we, you know, eat the candy bar instead of going to the gym and we buy the shiny new gadget instead of saving for retirement. And that's not good for us in the long run. Once we recognize about this about ourselves, though, there's a lot of strategies we can use to try to offset that challenge. And I think my favorite takeaway from this research is based on insights from Ayala at Fishbach at the University of Chicago and Caitlin Woolley at Cornell, who have done wonderful research showing most of us have the wrong intuition about the best way to pursue change when we're facing present bias. What we think we should do is just find the most effective path, say, to saving more or to exercising regularly. Like, what's the tactic? What's the approach that will lead to the best outcomes? And that's what we pursue. But actually, a minority of us take a different approach and it works better, which is to try to find a fun, instantly gratifying way to actually achieve your goals. So if you think about this in the context of the gym, it's a really natural trade off. You could either right pick the, the machine that will burn the most calories per minute, say the Stairmaster, or you could say, what's the most fun exercise I could do? Maybe it's a Zumba class with my friends. And what they find is if we choose something that's enjoyable we persist much longer on our goals. We don't just do it once and quit because that instant gratification that we get is that's how we make the decision of whether or not to do something. And so once we recognize it, we can use that insight to improve outcomes. So gamification is one way that organizations, apps try to make it more fun to pursue our goals. That's sort of putting bells and whistles, wrapping paper on the outside. But if you can choose a way to do the activity by making it social or by doing something I call temptation bundling, which is only letting yourself enjoy some treat while simultaneously pursuing your goal. Like I only get to binge watch a favorite TV show while at the gym on a treadmill or only get to listen to my favorite podcast while doing household chores. That basically gives you the, the spoonful of sugar approach, right, that Mary Poppins popularized in her wonderful song. Yes. And I just want you to know that um, I, I, of course, I love the spoonful of sugar, but um, you also mentioned the other line in that song, which is just parenthetically, one of my favorite. Should we sing it together? In every job that must be done, done, there, there is, is an, an element, element of, fun. of fun. You find the fun and snap the job's That's a so game. Good. Okay. So listen, I <laughs> am a huge part. <laughs> I, I mean, I am a huge Broadway show fan. So as soon as you um, are, you know, any show tune I will do, I just want you to know the funny thing about that is five, six years ago, I interviewed Julie Andrews in front of a live audience. Oh, my gosh. And so fun. Amazing. I, it's amazing. Forget it. It's like, I mean, besides you, this is like, that was my best interview. Um, <laughs> well, wait, besides me. <laughs> but what I, reason why I bring that up is I said to her, that line of that song always resonated with me 
because it always felt like no matter what, you know, if you could have some fun doing it, even if it was sort of like slightly disgusting, you could find some fun or you could find the funny aspect of it. And I said, you know, this is how I live my life. I talked about financial matters. I cover the economy and that like if I could do it and smile and make someone else smile and understand that it was so much easier. And she goes, well, really, it's just it's like my mantra of life. Like no matter what happens, if you could just have a little bit of fun, you can make a lot of other things happen. And so I thought that you would like that feedback. She would be so happy. You know, you have that that mantra out there. Okay, tomorrow we will have part two with Katie Milkman. I think she's great. Um, I encourage you guys to pick up the book. It's really a fascinating read. If you have a question and you want to know about how to get from where you are to where you want to be in your personal financial life, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And if you are on our website, if you're on the JillOnMoney.com website, just hit the contact button. And don't forget to tell us if you would like to come on the air live with us. Did I say this recently? I always should. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We are distributed by Cadence 13. Today, here's an, a, a task for you. Try to put your hands metaphorically on someone's back. Do something nice for somebody. Don't forget that you carry through this life so much potential, grit, growth, grace. Have some gratitude as well. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.